All right, guys. All right, so we're doing the parasha, the, the portion called Yetro. Jethro, okay? Um, starting at Exodus 18, what have you learned thus far? What have we been focusing on? What's been going on? Let's look at the notes. Egypt is in the desert. It is. It's Egypt in the world. Right. God is lovingly teaching his people and pulling the bondage out of them. What some what teachings has he been giving them? Trusting. Trust, trusting him, teaching him to trust. What else? He is the living water. He is the living water. Okay, give me place names. Okay, the waters of bitterness. Mara. What do we teach him at Mara? That he will make your bitterness sweet. That God can change your personal struggle into a testimony, into a blessing. He can heal you in this manner. Give me another place now. Sinai. Oh, we get to, then before, we get to, before we get to Sinai, I think further back. Elim, okay, the waters of wisdom, an oasis of wisdom, okay? And at Elim, he spoke about living water. How many springs? Twelve springs of living water. Twelve tribes, twelve disciples, okay? It's that same sort of issue. I will allow life giving sustenance to come out for you. Remember what Yeshua said about living water flowing through us. Okay, it will become like a wellspring in us and it will flow out to people that are walking around in a deserted, dry, <clears throat> spiritual land, looking for truth, looking, thirsting and hungry for righteousness. When they come to you, you will reflect Yeshua and through His Word and that spring will be able to sustain. Okay? New creation. Before you get there, you mentioned? 70 palms. 70 day palms. Okay? 70? Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, okay, 70 righteous people. Remember, the day palm is a symbol of righteousness. What? It's the most upright tree in Israel. Okay, it's the tallest domestic tree we have, and it is straight and upright. The rabbis say, may we be tall and upright as a day palm. That means I don't bend and sway to yield to other things. I will be righteous and I will walk in God's ways. What about the day palms? Produces something that God gave him. Right, the dates boiled down will give us honey. The land flowing with milk and honey. He was talking about that. Okay? So they boil it down, and what does honey tell us? Sweet Your word be as sweet as honey to my lips. Right. Okay? So God's instruction, His Torah, His righteousness will be sweet in your mouth. It will be something joyous. It won't be something when they say, oh, please, you, you know, celebrate Shabbat, and then people go, I don't need to do that. You will be, yes, at Shabbat. Computer down, and just, uh, all right, yes, congratulations, it's winter, you guys, good job, by the way. Got up out of bed, all right, and you fought all the way here, all right. You got pushed, but you made a choice to come, and that is difficult. All right? But you continue to choose that. And Shabbat should be a sweet thing. All right? God's instruction, His mitzvahot, or talk about blessing, talk about love, talk about grace, talk about celebrations. Those are joyously sweet things. Never mind the promised land and the promise which He's giving you, which is also a sweet thing. Okay? Each person here has a calling into a promise. And there's different levels to this whole instruction, but when He pulls us into the promised land, we go through teaching phases and we get us into the place where we will be used to bring glory to His kingdom. Okay? I'll discuss this a little bit later, what purposes we go through. Alright. Uh, we've missed a big one. There was a big wind and something parted. Yeah, Massive walls and remember, that spoke about creation. Unless you pass through the Ruach HaKodesh, and water, you will not see the kingdom of God, is what Yeshua told Nicodemus. And these are images through the parting of the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds, through the parting also of Jordan. Every time you pass through water, and it is parted by God's very instruction, His breath, His... Remember, it was the Ark of the Covenant when they stepped in. That was uttered by the very Spirit of God. It was written down by the finger of God, which was an idiom for His Spirit. When you pass through, 
you become something new. You will be able to come into the kingdom because of your faith, because you believe, and because this is what you walk for. Okay? So he takes us out of bondage into a new creation, and then he starts teaching, 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 and then he brings us into Sinai. Is that not the same as the start of the creation as well? Part of the water separated the waters from the waters. The waters above and the waters beneath. Absolutely. As we spoke about like that, when he said he parted the waters and the Israelites worked on dry land. The first time dry land appeared was when he created. He parted the seas and dry land came up. Okay, sort of bringing order. He's preparing something. He's creating something. And he was creating uh, half mixed. Remember, there was a mixed multitude that went up with them as well as the Israelites, and he brought them through that on dry ground. And when they came out, after Pharaoh and all of his cronies were washed away, they were no longer a nation or a group of people that were slaves. They are now... Free. One. Free. <coughs> one. Well, they're going to get there. And what we will see in this portion, they belong to God. They become a nation for the first time, instead of just a people. Alright, okay. So, more or less happy, okay? Alright, there's, I mean, there's, there's only like three chapters, but we could probably talk about this for six hours. So, I'm gonna, we're going to try and get through as much as possible. And Jethro, priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, still identified as a priest of Midian. Okay? Pagan or believer? Not yet. Pagan. Okay? He's still a priest of Midian, the Midianites, okay? They were not known for their Torah observance or for their, you know, walking with God. But God is also teaching Jethro how and who he is. Remember, he's teaching the world, he was teaching Egypt, he was teaching Pharaoh, he was teaching the Hebrews. And also to another personal level, he's teaching Jethro and his household, including Zippor. Okay? Moses' wife heard everything that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people that Hashem had brought Israel out from Egypt. With a struggle, there's a lovely word right here, Israel literally means to struggle with God, right? Wrestle. That's how he got his name. So through wrestling, God Moshe them out, he brought them out, he drew out his people. Okay? Yes, we still have times where Israel struggles with God. Right? There's, 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 a, there's three beautiful um, <coughs> thingies here. All right. So, in the beginning, we start off... Okay, I'm talking about in your walk now if you're a believer. We start with Israel. Okay, which means, yay, we struggle. How many of you have this testimony? But my God, I don't really want to do that. Why is it so hard? Why are you walking? Don't you know I need food? Where's my 500 rand because I don't know how to pay this? What are you doing over here? Why is it so difficult? Right? I wish I could just say that was all of you people. Well, this is not. Right? But he lovingly, he teaches you as he guides you, as he continues to provide for you. Just, and as Uncle Grant will always say at the 90, you know, hour number 99, and then 99 and like 59 minutes, and then he starts to push you right until the very edge. And you start to panic and you start to do things. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then boom. You're like, well, that was stupid. I just stressed myself out for the last seven days worrying about what I'm going to do. And God's just going, uh-huh, that's the point. Start focusing on me and stop focusing on your problem. The biggest thing people struggle with today is perspective. If you look at God instead of your issue, you will have more peace. Doesn't mean your issue just disappears, but you look at God and you, yeah. you know that you know that big white elephant in the room? I uh, believe you said you would take care of me, Lord. I'm, you know, using the scriptures just to reaffirm myself. In the beginning it's more like, oh you said you were gonna take care of me. What's that still doing here? <laughs> and in time he allows it just to pass. And you don't stress about it and you don't freak out about it as much because you learn instead of Focusing on your issue, you're focusing on God, and God will take care of that. Seek ye first the kingdom, the kingdom and its righteousness, and, and the rest will be given to you. Focus on me, I'll take care of the rest. Your job is to stay focused on God no matter what you face, no matter what attack comes, no matter what test He puts you through. Your job 
is to focus on Him. Not to whine, not to grumble, not to try and fight yourself. That is probably one of the hardest things you will go through, as in an early believer stage. But I promise you, the better you get at it, the more shalom you will have. Like Paul, uh, I think it was Paul that uttered something on, I've learned to be happy when I, in whatever my circumstances are. No matter what I'm going through, I'm looking at God. Because I know everything He's using is for His glory. Everything He's using is for me to be taught. Everything is using to build me up to be able to better reflect Him so that I can better reach the people that I need to. If He doesn't put you through a tough time with financial provision, how are you going to walk up to someone who's struggling financially and say, don't worry, everything's going to be alright? Oh, you or whatever. You with your 300,000 rand in the bank and a big smile on your face. What do you know about struggling, son? Do you really think I should do this as the best advice for me right now? It's amazing how He prepares the people who go through tough times, who run away from God, who try to go through these things by themselves, who struggle with certain addictions, who struggle with certain issues, where they come from pasts, attacks, whatever it is. And then just when someone's feeling alone, it's the most beautiful thing to watch. And then they go, you know, you don't really understand. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Let me tell you about what I was struggling with. And you share where you came from and where He brought you. And how He prepared you. And how you had to fight and lean on God. And He carried you. And He broke those chains. And He brought you into this new creation that you are. So now when you look back and you go, look at where I came from. I'm not that man anymore. Baruch Hashem. And they look at you and they go, what do you mean it's possible? What do you mean He did that? Stand with me. Let's take a walk. And I'll show you what He can do. Our God is not some little God we put in a box. Our God is the creator of everything. Do you think for a second when he went, I think I'll just create life. He spoke out of, he took a mold of sand and he went, Phew. you realize how complex the body is. We're busy playing on, on, on Uncle Tony's machine. Um, and it like, you, you put on these headphones and it does like this little scanny thing and it goes through your entire body and it picks up areas of where certain, you know, because everything like vibrates, stop me from explaining this one, okay? You know, every atom works at a certain level and its molecular levels and all the rest of it they go through and everything vibrates at a certain frequency. So when all of a sudden something is not vibrating properly, you know, it's when we're maybe limping around the corner instead of sprinting, okay? And this machine picks that up. And you put on this thing and then you start doing some tests and we were just goofing around. Because you know, I suffer from uh, ectodermal dysplasia, I don't sweat, okay, at all born that way. Genetic problems and all the rest of it. But just to see what was going on and what was picking up and all the thing and the amount of tests and the amount of things you look to. And this thing does a, like an MRI scan and then all of a sudden you see your eyes and you see this and you see this and then it starts measuring your DNA to all the point. You have no idea how many different names of different things that we understand that we don't really understand but that are in your body. Scientists today cannot even figure out why the body does certain things, how babies are formed and all the rest of it, and God's going, yeah, yeah, talk to me about it. I just went, <laughs> and it was there. <laughs> let, me just, let, me just, let me just, you know, go through the whole process of, of explaining DNA to you. The book is not about explaining creation. We would never understand it. Can you imagine, three and a half thousand years ago, or you suddenly you're talking to Moshe, hey Moshe, How's things? No, we're good, man. Let me tell you about DNA. <laughs> Talk to me about sheep, dude. I don't understand DNA. <coughs> so let's go to a molecular level. What? Did you know atoms? Mm -hmm. What is atom? <laughs> I think you said it wrong. It's atom. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go to this whole process where, you know, it is unbelievable. You know, just something so simple, and it blows my mind every time. If you do yourself a favor, there's a DVD by, um, well, there's two DVDs that will try to put this into perspective. Uh, Louis Giglio, okay, many of you guys know. Okay, you get the indescribable DVD which talks about the stars and the heavens and all the rest of it, and you start to see how really tiny you are in the masses of what we know is the universe. Never mind what we don't know. But there's another one that kind of does the same thing with the human body. It's a DVD called Alive, okay? And he starts to put together the cells and how these things snap together and the DNA strands and how far they go like, to the moon and back type of thing like seven times or something silly. And this is all just composed in your body. 
and then we sit and we grumble because we, our God, who created all of this, can't sort out my issue. It's a perspective problem. While He's teaching you, if He can create you, if He can heal you, if He can create all of this in a couple of words, I'm pretty sure <coughs> He's able to take care of you and your needs and be able to get you to where He wants you to be. Okay? All we have to do is learn not to struggle. Okay? And He will take us from struggle, and there's, well, in many cases He uses something called a Moshe. In whatever shape or form you have it, someone who will draw you out and draw you unto himself. In one way, shape or form, we all have this, where you are able to reach into people's lives and God uses you and you shake someone like this and then you go, come, let's go for a walk. And you pull them out of their bondage and God breaks those chains. Okay, sadly, a lot of people go, oh, do the good back things. And a lot of them do. But a lot of them come. Okay? And he brings you into something called scripture. It's called, I'm going to use the Hebrew, Yeheshu. Okay. Yeheshu Run. Okay. It's Jeshu Run. Okay. But there's no J in Hebrew. It's up to you. Okay. This, we're hopefully spelling it more or less the way it sounds. Okay. Yeheshu Run is a name given to Israel when they become perfect, when they live out their purpose. Where they become who they are meant to be. And there's no longer struggle, but fulfillment. To me, in many instances, where Christians and where we struggle the most is here. You struggle with your flesh, you struggle with your emotions, you struggle with your issues. You have fleshly, you have soulish. And then you become mature. Oh, that looks horrible. Let's try that again. Remember, Paul talks about becoming mature. When I was a child, we thought like a child and acted like a child. Like when I was Amen. I left my childish words. I put away my childish things. Some of us struggle in between here our entire Christian life. Our entire believing life, I wish I could say it was just Christians, but I'm sure plenty, plenty of our brothers, our Jewish brothers and sisters struggle with that same thing. You're born in a very physical world. How do we deal with this perception problem of what's going on? Our focus should be more spiritual. Although we understand that God takes care of the physical, He can not only take care of me and break my chains of addiction, whether physical or emotional or whatever, he will get us to this maturity where we are able to focus solely on God so that we can see exactly who is in charge, what He is doing, and just have enough perspective to when you get encountered with a brick wall or a testimony or all the rest of it, you take a step back and you go, okay, God, what are you doing? Instead of, our first instinct is to go and we grumble. It's too hard. I don't like it. I'm tired. It's too cold. We have this in us and God has to get it out of us. And through that, through this process of leading us and making it fullness that, you know what? God is good. All the time. Some people will go through struggles and you will never hear about it. Why? Because grumbling helps nothing. Stressing helps nothing. Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I'm standing out and waiting for something great. And sometimes it doesn't go your way. Sometimes you will struggle. Sometimes things that you thought were going to be done. People who you thought were going to be healed will not be healed. You will lose people. And you will cry. And you will struggle. And you will have this little kick and fuss and all the rest of it. But remember, please, if anything, remember this. That God sees the bigger, fuller picture. It's not what, what is best for you. It's what best for that person. What is best for their spouse. What is best for the people who maybe the spouse is going to be used to prepare. He loves the flock. He goes to seek the lost. 
And remember, it's not just about your comfort right now. He's happy to love you right now. And He provides for you right now. But His perspective is eternity. Do I give you a million bucks right now? And go, that's it, my boy. This is it. This is as good as it's going to get. Disease will still come. Death will still come. But you know what? Pat yourself on the back because you don't need anything. Or do I put you through a little bit of a couple of tight months to be able to give you perspective, to be able to give you testimony, to draw you through that, to get you to the other side, so that when you come out on the other side, you are so much stronger, and then in eternity, you will understand exactly what I was doing. Okay? This is so off topic. It's not even <laughs> <laughs> So much for getting through this quickly. All right, so he, here's the testimony. And that everything God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people. That Hashem had brought Israel out of Egypt. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zephorah, Moses' wife, after her being sent off. And her two sons, of whom one was Gershom, because he said, I was an alien in a foreign land. And the other one's name is Eliezer, because my father's God was my help and rescued me from Pharaoh's sword. Okay? These, these, are, these are what's called Yahwistic names, if I can use that, that, fun, that time, okay, that phrase. Is that you will know who he serves by what he calls his kids. Okay, it's a very, very interesting thing. You know, people today will be like, uh, my son's name is Jonathan because, you know, he's a gift. Or, um, you know, we share the testimony with Jaden because God hears. He gave us Jaden. Um, or whatever those cases may be. Daniel, in these times, would tell you that God alone is my judge. And that is what he was going through, and what, in many instances, can be the very function of this person. Okay? And you go through this whole thing, and you, you should know exactly who he serves and, you know, what he believes just by the name of his sons, or what he was going through. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and his sons and his wife came to Moshe, to the wilderness, to which he was camping at the mountain of God. Family becomes united. Can you imagine Zipporah hearing about all these things that are going on in Egypt, and the kids freaking out because daddy is over there? What is God doing? And that a priest of Midian leaves his land, and he comes to Sinai. And he hears about the great glorious things that God continues to do. It was the testimony that brought him there. They weren't waiting at home waiting for Moses to come to him. And he said to Moshe, I, your father in law Jethro, have come to you and your wife with your two sons with her. And Moses went out to his father in law and he bowed and he kissed him. And they asked each other how they were. And they came to the tent. Isn't that a really good statement? Moses, this mighty prophet of God, comes to bow to a priest of Midian. Son in law. Alright. Although he knows who God well, who God is, notice the statement. God brought Israel out, not Moses. Okay? He still comes in and then there's still this, this beautiful culture of he is an elder. He is my father in law. Alright? And then they, they talk to each other and they bring him in, welcome him. And Moses told his father-in-law everything that Hashem has done to Pharaoh and to Egypt with God to Israel. All the hardship that he found them on the way. Notice that, that little term. The way. And Hashem rescued them. Testimony after testimony after testimony. And Jethro rejoiced over all the good that Hashem had done for Israel. And then he rescued him from, from Egypt's hand. Now this is funny. Israel, this baby nation that is being formed, right? Has come across two strangers in a very short space of time. They crossed over and then all of a sudden they go through a little money, money pants face and all of a sudden the Amalekites come out. Completely off territory, out of queue, just to attack the weak and the slow at the back of the herd. Okay? Scare them enough they'll run away. Moses strengthens them, and he goes up and he prays, and then you know the story, he goes, and Joshua fights. Okay, and God gives a victory. And now you have another stranger come. Oh, jolly good, how are they going to take us? All the testimonies of God had gone before them. The Amalekites came out in fear and tried to shut them down. 
Jethro hears about everything and he rejoices in what God has done for them. How many of you have that testimony? Some people will be like, hmm, you're a little obsessed about God, don't you think? Take a step back. But <laughs> <laughs> most people. And people freak out and they try and shut you down and they try and say, well, you know, you can't actually prove God. Or, you know, that's, 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 I'm really happy he's doing that for you. But for me, and you get other people who have no background whatsoever, and he goes, God did what? I can't, I can't believe that. This is amazing to me. What do you mean he's real? What do you mean this God went out and did that to Pharaoh and to Egypt? How? Two and a half million people? How? What? How, how do you feed them? Where did the water come from? Why are there still cattle that are growing in the back there? This is, this is weird, man. How is this possible? And your testimony will ring truth. Remember what he did to them on the way. And Jethro said, Blessed is Hashem. Well, that's a pretty big statement coming from a pagan priest. Yeah. Okay? If at face value he is full of, of that. Blessed be Hashem who rescued you from Egypt's hand and from Pharaoh's hand. Who rescued the people from under Egypt's hand. Now I know... Oh, I love this statement. Now I know that Hashem is bigger than all the gods because of the thing they plotted against them. Man, what I have seen is unbelievable. Your God is real. And isn't that the point of the wonders that God said? So that they will know. And I'm not talking about intellectual understanding. I'm talking about heart. And who is like you? Mika Mocha. Who is like you, God? And people cannot. And when He comes again, they will be in awe. They will be blown away. They will not be able to understand that this God who created everything, who people thought was a figment or a folk tale, some random idea that people were clinging on to because you know what people need to feel like they have a purpose and it really helps if you have a creator who created stuff because that means he created you for a purpose. You know, this whole anti you know, this evolution thing, you know, is probably better said. But you know, you've got to give these people a little crutch to help them through their life. And when he comes and he goes, mm, well actually I may do. And then what does it say? Every knee will every knee will die. And every time will confess. You know, the time of revelations will come where God will teach the same as what he was teaching in Pesach. And many will shun him, but many will go. Now I know. Amen, amen. I say in the same breath, some people don't, are not just um, surprised and amazed at what you become, but God uses them to reinforce you. Because you get comments like, ah, you have something that God has put in you that he hasn't given to any of us. And then they start overloading you with responsibilities. So just pray for us in this situation and what not and what not. But also another way in which God reinforces you if you are in that. Yeah, and he also so other people. He also he also uses that to change your perspective. Mm -hmm. that I need to be so much focused on the spiritual side of things that they don't really care if I, if I give them physical stuff. You know, people come up to you and they'll say, pray for me. I'm going through a really tough time. They won't tell you what it is. So you can't help them solve it. Why? Exactly what Auntie C is saying is that when God shines through you, He may know and what they've seen in how God has answered your prayers that as Scripture says, He will ride across the heavens to come to your aid. At your intercession, at your supplication, God goes out to heal others. And we pray that that purpose, that our people will come to the knowledge. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering. Dum, dum, dum. Now he knows. And he takes an offering, and, and a burnt offering, an elevation offering, an ole offering. And sacrifices it to God. What has he done? What has happened? Heart has changed. Heart has changed. What does that mean? Action is very good to God. 
Okay, so we can say in an instance he's making a teshuva. Okay, he's returning back to him. What does that make him? Hebrew. A Hebrew. He crosses over. Okay? And there's something very interesting here. In, in the ancient times, or in with Yeshua and pre-times, for a proselyte, someone who converts to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they have to make him a certain offering to make to seal it. Guess which offering it was? Yes. Elevation offering. A burnt offering. What he is doing here, and program this in your brain. Every time an ole offering, everything goes up. Everything is dedicated to God. So what am I saying? Have a cow. Have a goat. Have this. I'm yours. Everything I am gets transferred onto that altar because I press, I give. It is me that goes before you. It is to show you the picture of when Yeshua goes before you and you have given him everything. And he stands, you have given everything to God. He has given you the betrothal cup and you said, I will give you everything I am and I will take everything that you are. And I rededicate, I dedicate myself fully to you. Same image. I am yours and you are mine. The essence of virtually every covenant so that I will be their God and they will be my people. From Abraham right on to what we call the new covenant or the renewed covenant. The essence of it all. A man comes up to them and he sees and he hears the testimony and he rejoices and he goes and he makes a sacrifice to God. And Aaron and all of Israel's elders came to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. All the elders of Israel come and they break bread because now this man has become one of us. He belongs to Hashem. And it was the next day and Moses said to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. And Moses' father-in-law saw that what, what he was doing for the people and he said what's this thing that you are doing for my people for the people why are you sitting by yourself and the entire people is standing up by you from morning until evening and Moses said to his father-in-law because the people come to inquire me of God when they have a matter it comes to me and I judge between each one and his companion and I will make known God's laws or God's instructions and his instructions his mitzvot. okay so there's a cue. Please take a number. You are number 347. You will be sitting in the queue with the guy you're arguing with for the next four hours. <laughs> so you're sitting in the wilderness, right? Life is fine. Are you having a good day? Oh, this is a tough one. Moses had to go pray about this one. How long do we have to wait to hear from God? <laughs> Bing! You understand why Jethro is going? Number one, my boy, you, you, you know you need to actually be fed so that you can feed others. One of the biggest problems spiritual leaders have is that they do not make enough time to go and spend time with God to gather strength and food so that they can go to the people and go, this is what God showed me. Because a lot of the time is what they seek from you is love and compassion. And man, when you're being driven crazy by 400 people arguing about rubbish. Remember, this is so based that God, to the point where, oh well, you know that cattle, or this man didn't go to the potty on his side of the tent. You know, he actually came into my crossing. What are you doing? Walk outside the camp. God goes to, to the point where He tells you where it's acceptable to go to the loo. Take a shovel, go outside, dig a hole. When you finish, cover it up. Then you come back in. Why does God have to write that down? He says, I dwell among you. Do you think this is okay? We have a physical aspect of <clears throat> and it's kind of unclean. Disease. Good. So you're taking care of your, 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 your cattle. There's no, we don't have massive crawls to keep separate things going on. Well, you know, that bull poked my cow and now I've had to sort that out. But it's his fault, but he says, why'd you put your cow there? Can you understand how annoyingly silly these things could be? 
And Moses is sitting there going, are you kidding me? Seriously, fix this car, put your bull on the other side. What are you doing? Just to show them not only how to deal with God, but how to deal with each other. You've been slaves your entire life. You've been told how you're supposed to deal with each other. Whoever's strongest, you can do whatever you want. You go through this whole funny process of things. And you start pushing and pulling and, 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 and money over things. And then he has to sit there from morning until evening. Can you imagine listening to whining and grumbling and moaning for 12 hours? For 40 years. <laughs> he says, well, then, thank God he has mercy. He's like, wait, just say something. Say something. Say something. Okay? And Moses' his father was said to him, the thing that you are doing isn't good. Why? You're not getting time and these people are not getting served. It's unfair on them to wait eight hours to have a chat with someone. Okay? You'll be worn out, both of you and these people who are with you, because the thing is too heavy for you. And you won't be able to do it by yourself. This is the verse I was telling you about. Expansion comes, leaders need to be built up. Now listen to my voice and I'll advise you. And may God be with you. Let Him discern. Let Him help you understand where you are. You be for the people toward God and you will bring the matters to God. And you'll enlighten them with the laws and the instructions. And you'll make known to them the way. Same thing in which they'll go and the thing that they'll do and you will envision out of all the people worthy men who fear God and remember this goes along with also Timothy it's talking about leaders of people criteria number one men who are worthy men who fear God men of truth way truth you see what Yeshua is starting to referring to who hate bribery. Okay, some of your translations will say, will despise money. Okay, so that you cannot be bought. If you are a leader, the problem with Israel in many times is that a really wealthy man, Ray comes up, oh, let's use Raymond and Ray as an example, and he comes up and then he's got, you know, Raymond is sitting there with, you know, he walks in there with his Rolls Royce and then he walks up to the judge and he goes, hey, this guy's like, you know, he's a click, man, come on, sort this out. You know, you know I'll take care of you, just sort it out. Yeah, but he's really influential in the community. If I'm, if I, if I annoy, you know, Raymond, and and you know, he's wrong, and I and I give it to Ray, you know, I might not get reelected next year because you know all these people are on the panel, and he knows all of them, man. And God's saying, <clears throat> I put you there for my purpose. You are there to judge according to my statutes because you're sitting underneath me. You're there because I put you there. Notice why you should fear God above enjoying a bribe because God is going to hold you accountable are you more scared of being re-elected or are you more scared of the God who's standing behind you with a big poker going Pook! I think you should you, you know what you do yeah you do that hey? you're my boy you can't do this he's trying to train you up to understand that again money is not everything justice truth righteousness those are the things that we need to focus on Truth is truth, just is just. Doesn't matter which side of the fence you come from. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You fix up. Okay? There shouldn't be a bad status thing at all. And you'll set chiefs of thousands, chiefs of hundreds, chiefs of fifties, chiefs of tens over them. And they will judge the people at all times. And it will be, they'll bring every matter that is too big to you. And they will judge every matter that is small. And make it lighter on you, and they'll bear it with you. If you do this thing, and Hashem will command you, then you'll be able to stand, and also this entire people will come to its place in peace. Shalom. Everything is okay because we are being dealt with. They're helping us discern it. It's not difficult to get a word from God because I don't have to stand eight hours. How many of you would be here today if you had to stand there, day in and day out, waiting for God to shine a light on a certain problem? Well, what's the point? By the third day and you haven't been seen yet, how many of you will still be standing in the queue? What's the point? God doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Can't handle this. This guy's just doing whatever he wants. I'm being oppressed. God doesn't care. Why doesn't he strike him down? 
Why doesn't he, why doesn't he send Moses to my camp? What's going on? Leaders, this is my thing. People, wherever you go, wherever you work, whatever you're doing, you have influence on people around you. Whether you like it or not, someone looks to you. And especially when people start to realize, like Auntie C said, when they look to you and they realize God is with you, and then they go, I need you to pray for me. What do you think about this? What's going on here? Guess what you're doing? Do you fear God enough? Do you stand there and look to God's statutes and God's instructions on what He has said? According to Torah, this is what God said we must do. And this is what we've forgotten. Mm. So it makes me think of Shaul, right? When he was one step at a time, up to the point where he was no more used to Yeah, he was slipping. He ran a huge wall. He, he, started, he started slipping and then he started sprinting away from God. Yeah. Okay? He did things in his own strength according to his own things because he was impatient. Because he was, it was too difficult. And you know, it's tough, guys. When people start to look, look at you, it's draining. Because your life is no longer your life anymore. It's God's life, man. And when people go, uh, <clears throat> so um, I've got this issue I need to come and chat to you about. Guess what? You reflect God to people who do not have that. And when they come to you and they look at you and then they go and tell me something. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I don't take anything. Let's move one minute, please. Aha, there you are. God said. That should be so pre-programmed. That you understand the heart of the God, you understand why He does things, that you understand this is for your good. It is way, it is the truth. It will bring peace. And then when you start to share what God has instructed, it's very simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all soul, and mind. And the second is, love your neighbor as yourself. This is echoed in what the ten instructions or the ten commandments is listed. And also, where, where, was, where was your poor and his sons? You brought us here to spend time with our father. I can't see. Where's my husband? Do not become so fixated on your calling that people, sadly enough, I've heard this problem. I know of a guy, I, well, I know him. But unfortunately, this man is, is one of those 120% or nothing type of guys. Okay, and that's, that's very awesome if he has the right head. And he, he goes and he becomes passionate. And he runs into church and he's like, you know, God has really told me this is it. And he is at church six days a week and he's busy teaching and he's volunteering and he's helping out and he's doing anything and everything because he feels, I need to be 120% for God and I need to do this and I need to be there and all the rest of it. He's divorced now. His kids are finding fathership and stability in another man's life. Because the first place God says you sort out your calling is to your family and then it goes out from there. This is why Shabbat is in your home. This is why Pesach is in your home. Okay, remember, you take the offering and you go back and you eat it in your house. Celebrate with me, yes, but celebrate with your family. Teach, be with your wife, be with your kids. You, know, you want them to go in the ways that God has ordained. You want to teach them, you want to teach your wife, you want to lead them in the way you should. They have to see you. And you have, to, you have to love them. And I know it's tough. You guys get irritated and your kids drive you crazy. And you're sitting there having Shabbat. And a couple of times you just talk about this. Oh, go watch some TV. <laughs> <laughs> they just bounce it up and down because they don't really understand. But you do. You make them sit down. You give them coloring books. You make them do whatever they need to do. I don't care if you're tired. If you're tired, you want strength, you go to a shim, you don't go to a TV. You light those lights and you bless your family and you stand there even if you don't want to be there, God wants to be there. You invite Him in your home. No one else. Don't get so focused on your calling that you forget about your flock. But Moses didn't also have a very good role model because he's whoever upset. 
He was sitting on his lap. He was sitting at God's feet. It doesn't matter where you come from, let him change you. And he has to come in. And this is very difficult. It's very true what you're saying, what you see. He has to come in and he has to take those standards and he has to put those things in place because it is for the glory of God. I said last week, the best thing you can give your children, the best thing you can give your wife is Hashem. Because when you can't be there, he is there. When you can't teach them, when you can't get this through their head, he can. And guess what? If you were perfect, you wouldn't have had to deal with, you wouldn't have had to go to Hashem. We wouldn't need the sacrifice. So are you the best role model for them, or is God better? We try and reflect Him with everything, but we have to put that institution in place. Your kids probably will not, especially now when you're starting this whole thing. If you, you, you know, I think we need to do Shabbat. Or if you do it for a while, it becomes mundane. You lose the joy. In the beginning, it's one of the most difficult things you do. It's Friday night. Oh, I'm not allowed to do this, not allowed to do Okay. All right. It becomes so much about what I'm not allowed to do, I forget about what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm really tired. I really just want to watch TV now. I'm going to sit there and pretend to like bread and, and wine and stuff like that. And then it becomes, you start to find the joy. And you start to see the blessing. And you start to go through this process. And now on a Friday night, it's not even a question. You go, you're, you're on autopilot. You go and you get challah. You got your wine on the table. You set the table up. Everything sorted. Food is cooked before sundown. And there we go. We're sitting. We're ready. What are we waiting for? It's not for TV. Thank God. We're waiting to go sit at God's table with my family. I say, once a week, man, I love you. If I haven't said it enough, let me tell you now, I love you. All those little cookies and the sandwiches and the time you spend with the kids. When you look at your kids and you go, you know, thank you for the cuddles. I'm a big, strong boy, but I love to cuddle. <laughs> I want cuddles for my children. I terrorize my kids. If I hold them tight and I say, no, what's, what's the password? I have to give daddy kisses. <laughs> Daddy wants his kisses. And I'm probably going to do that until my son's 16 and really embarrass him. <laughs> when we sit to daddy's lap and give him kisses. That's why I'm not going to train him martial arts so I can lock him up in a place so that I can't give him kisses. Okay? I need that love and I want him to know that above everything, above all of this, and I'm, I love my flock dearly. I love my God with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. But man, he gave me those kids and he gave me that woman. Who is patiently sitting downstairs while kids are sticking things up their noses and running around doing stuff, and she's going, yeah, I'm having fun, I'm doing this so good. I'm doing this for my husband because those people upstairs, they need this time. And it is the most, you know, she's, she struggles. And yet, every week she starts to suffer. We're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this because people need God, and I need God, and this is a good thing, and we go through this. And the sacrifice. On Shabbat, I look, I can look at my wife and I can hold her hand no matter if we've had a disagreement or not. And I can say the Eshef Dahil, I read from Proverbs 31 and I'm saying, you know what, you are worth far more than jewels and rubies. Blessed is a woman who fears God. And I love you. Thank you for my sandwiches. Thank you for my cuddles. Thank you for sitting with me on the couch and not saying a word. Just being there for me. This is what Shabbat is about. This is what God needs to instill in your heart and in your mind that you can go through this thing and you can look to your spouse and you can go, what? you know what? I am your biggest fan. I don't know if I ever told you that enough, but I love you. You are my favorite person. I think you're just fantastic because nine times out of ten, you're busy beating yourself up about something and you're so busy sorting out the kids that you forget to look to the person next to you and you go, well, you're my number one. I am so grateful that God gave you to me. Because as the rabbis teach, no woman and no man is whole by himself. Only when they become one flesh does that perfectly piece that was pulled out gets put back and sewn in its place. A man is never complete until he has his wife. And man, when she's not there, it feels like something's missing, right? Can I hear the married men say, Amen. Amen. Right. And then when we come in and we sit down together, and we find that peace, and that you start to get molded together, your children will see God's love reflected through you. Marriage counseling, one on one. Okay. So, oh. Where 
wherever you are, you have people looking up to you. In your going, make disciples and teach them everything that I've taught you. Not only Torah, not only Yeshua's instructions, but what must be pertinent to your spiritual walk. What I've taught you. That's what you share. Share your experiences, don't share your theology. People want testimony. They want to see God is real. They don't want an idea about something that doesn't make sense to them. Okay? So wherever you go, whether you like it or not, you reflect God to somebody. Teach them. Help them. Reflect God. And it will be, they will bring it, okay, sorry. So when, they, when it becomes too much for them and you don't understand, you go to someone higher than you. And you bring that before them. And if it becomes too